In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Fellowship, belonging, being with one another, all very hot topics. Whether we're talking about Brexit here in England, whether we're talking about the state of um, political elections and movements throughout Europe or in North America or anywhere else, the concept and question of belonging is really important one for us all. And nowhere more is it important that, than within the Christian context. Belonging as in the being with one another and of one another, the koinonia. And this is the concept of the body of Christ, that we are all together in the body of Christ, Christ is our head. And we all move and function and breathe and work together, we rejoice together, we follow in our Lord's footsteps together, we share in sufferings together. And so the concept of belonging and koinonia is, is an important one. When we think of what it means, this word fellowship, what it means in the Christian context, um, even if you look at, at secular dictionaries, it actually states that in Christianity, it refers to fellowship or communion with God and with fellow Christians. So our understanding of fellowship is to be in communion with one another and then in communion with God, with and through one another as well. I want to look at a, a, a few models of what this fellowship looks like. The first comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10. Verse 17 reads, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even demons are subject to us in your name. Now the Lord said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Then he goes on to say, Nevertheless, important word, nevertheless, be cautious, be aware. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So they came in a sense of fellowship and together, and Cornelia coming and saying, Look, we're here, 70, so there's that fellowship amongst each other. And then they said, Demons are subject to us in your name. So they didn't deny the relationship with him. They didn't say, Oh, we cast them out. They said, Demons are subject to us in your name. We've cast them out in your name. So, where is the problem here? Surely, if they're there with each other in mission, in ministry, and they're there proclaiming and admitting that what they are doing, they are doing with and through our Lord, it must be right. But our Lord says to us that even in our fellowship together, even in this fellowship meeting, when we come together, when we're sitting here, we're listening together, to recognize that what binds us, what is our greatest testimony, what is our greatest driver, is not just that we come together. That's wonderful. It's not just that we share in the Word of God. That's wonderful. It's not even that we share and spread the Word of God beyond these doors. What we must really rejoice in is that our names are written in heaven. That we have that entitlement. Now, we're not guaranteed getting in, of course, because we still must live the life, walk the walk, make those decisions on a daily basis. And again, to clarify, that is not without God's grace. So it's not just because of our actions. It is a variety of things together. It is the incredible selfless act of salvation on the cross. It is the resurrection. It is then our works and our choice. It is our membership to the body of Christ through the sacraments. But then it is also God's grace that binds us and empowers us and allows us to move forward. So let's 
Remember that one. Second model. Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25. Now we all know this, it's verses 1 to 5, it's the account of the ten virgins. Now remember that this is a parable. It's a story. It's not about ten people who actually lived. And it's not really a wedding feast. It's our Lord saying that there are times when we're there together, we're journeying together, you're going to go and you're going to have a good intention. He says, ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom, they were all together. Five were wise, five were foolish. The wise took their lamps and took oil with them. The foolish just took their lamps. Verse 5, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. The first model of fellowship, they all come back and say to our Lord, look, the demons are subject to us in your name. We're doing these wonderful things in your name for you through you. The second scenario is people journeying together and they're all waiting. But as they're waiting, they all slumber and they sleep. They all fall short. And, you know, our Lord could have used any number. He could have used 10%. He could have said there were 10 and one slumbered and slept. Or all slumbered and slept, but only one didn't have enough oil. But he wanted us to realize that we are all subject to that weakness and have that potential of forming. So out of the ten, the ten slumber and sleep. And when they awaken, five of them, half of them, realize they don't have enough oil to continue. Those are high odds. It means that we are susceptible. And therefore we must realize that our weakness is there. Don't just plan for today. There is a nevertheless here as well. The first nevertheless was don't rejoice in these things that you can do but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The second nevertheless is don't think that you won't slumber and sleep. Don't think that you are instantly, automatically going to have enough oil. Realize that there are times of weakness and realize that the wedding feast is here for you and the bridegroom certainly is coming. There's no doubt about that. The bridegroom is coming. A, try to stay awake. And B, make more arrangements. Don't just plan for the bare minimum. And that is such an important warning for all of us. We all have a tendency to sometimes plan for the bare minimum. Just what gets us through. Just enough. You know, I'm trying to streamline. I have this tendency of trying to streamline. But you know what? It often works against me. Because streamlining is great. But when you go one step too far and streamline too much, you realize you've been caught out. So in spiritual life, in our journey with God, in our lives with Him, we need to try to do more. Try to engage more. Try to spend more time. Try to commit as much as we can. Third scenario. This one is from the Old Testament, from the book of Exodus, chapter 32. Now the scenario here is that the children of Israel are journeying. They're all trying to get to the promised land as they've been promised. Moses goes up to the mountain called by God to receive the commandments they're supposed to live by. But he's delayed. God wants to keep him up there for a period of preparation. Starting in verse 1. Now, people, when the people saw Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, they gathered together to Aaron and they said, Come, make us a God that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out, out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has come of him. 
So they recognize that they're waiting for Moses. They recognize that he brought them out of Egypt. They recognize that he was there before them. But then they say, this man, this man Moses, we don't know what's happened to him. And they don't just make a small request. They don't say, um, can we go up and see where he is? Or can you go up and see where he is? Or can we pray that he comes down quickly? Or they jump to the nth degree. What do they say to him? What do they say to Aaron, the priest of the Most High? Make us a God. Now, now, wait, wait, just wait. You were in Egypt. You were led out of Egypt. You saw the plagues. You saw the ridiculous things that happened to the people of Egypt because they stood before the Lord God. You saw the angels. You saw the parting of the sea. You saw water from a rock, manna from heaven, quails in the desert. You've seen these miraculous things. And yet, you want to turn away from the God who has given you all this. And you want a God. Make us a God. That's what they said. They didn't say, let's pray to God. Make us a God. Now this is something interesting. It's an admission by the children of Israel that this God is really an inanimate object that has no power. Because they say, come make us gods that shall go before us. Now, can anyone see the important word here? That. Not who. That. We have our God who is the creator. But when you start to worship inanimate objects, animals, figures, pagan deities, they are that. That's all they are. That. Not who. And yet, by their own admission that these gods are that, they still want to make these gods who, that they're going to follow. So, what does Aaron do? The priest of God. He tells them to gather their jewelry. He says that he will do this for them. Now, they left Egypt with everything they had. In that culture, they, their wealth would have been the jewelry. The gold that they amassed during that time. They gave it away. They had it melted to make a god. So we have these three types of fellowship. One, in which the apostles come back and say, look, here we are, we are preaching with those who are there, taking pride in the fact that they had had results. The second, those who journey together, but stumble and slumber and sleep. And the third, journeying, and not only slumber and sleep, but turn towards another God because of a challenge that they've, that they've suddenly faced. So here is the question. What of these kinds of fellowship? They were all on a spiritual journey. The apostles went out to preach the word of God. The virgins, a parable, nevertheless, but they were waiting, and the children of Israel going through the wilderness of their lives to a land promised by God. We are going to be on these journeys, and we're going to have different results. We are sometimes going to be like the apostles who have a great positive result. We are sometimes going to be like the virgins who we try but we slumber and sleep. And we are sometimes going to be like the children of Israel who fail miserably and look towards other gods. 
yet we are there together for that journey. What do we do for each other in that case? In the first case, our Lord says to them, it's okay, we're distracted, this isn't where you should find your value, this isn't what should give you your purpose, this isn't the marker of success, but your names are written in heaven. Be reassured. You're okay. Just don't get it all mixed up. Stay focused. Remind each other about what you're doing. When you start to use these markers and indications, remind each other that's not what's important. And that is the wisdom for our Lord sending them out two by two. They weren't sent out alone. Because if one gets these ideas, the other will say, well, just be careful. Just be careful. There is this other idea. There is this other reason. In the second case, journey together. Keep your eyes on each other. Try not to stumble. Try not to sleep. And the warning here is, take extra oil from the beginning. Remind each other, if you're there for the journey, before you set off, even if you have those unwise friends, or even if you are one of them, prepare. We're all going to fall short at some stage. The beauty of this being a parable is that it is eternalized in Scripture. And so when you and I read it, we understand that it's a very clear warning. That when we plan even to go and meet the bridegroom, that we take more oil with us. We be vigilant. We nudge each other if we're in the slumber and sleep. Prepare ourselves for the journey and journey to get a strength. And then of course in the last example. Moses comes back down. Be patient. Be patient in your journey. There will be times when we will say along our journey, God, what are you doing with my life? What do you mean by this? Why am I so confused? Why aren't you giving me the right answers? I want an answer now. I want to know now. I want you to guide me now. And then, when we don't get the answer, we also create our own gods. We create our own distractions. Sometimes, similar to what we should be doing, so in one respect they didn't go a thousand miles off, they wanted to follow gods, the wrong gods, but they wanted to follow gods. And another respect it was a million miles away, because it was pagan gods and not the god who had saved them. And so we need to understand that we take that as a warning to us. That there will be times when we're going through this wilderness, we're totally unsure, we feel like we've been left alone. God seems to be absolutely silent. And that feels like a really lonely place. It's a frightening place too. Because we've left what we knew, even if it was toxic, we knew it. So they had left Egypt. They were slaves. But they left Egypt. And they were in this wasteland that was a, a journey. And it was frightening. But at those frightening times, to remember what they had actually left behind. You see, we, we sometimes live lives that we romanticize. We sometimes look back and think, well, actually, we were better off. They said, they said to Moses, oh, the, you know, the meat and the bread, but you were slaves. Did you bring us here to die? No, actually, God saved you by opening the sea and letting you flee and killing Pharaoh and his army. 
We romanticize what we've left behind and we forget the treachery. And because of the fearful silence, we're unsure. Be patient. Be still. Just as our Lord stood up out of the back of that ship where there was the storm. Just as Moses actually came down as promised with the commandments that God had given, so too in our lives will God appear at just the right time. His right time. Not mine, because I have my own understanding and perception of what the right time is. Now, I think we all understand it's not necessarily right, but it's our expectation. And it takes faith, and it takes patience, and it takes confidence, it takes a knowledge of God to say, Lord, you led me out of Egypt. You led me across a parted sea. You gave me water from a rock. So I know you'll come through. And that sense of fellowship is when we encourage each other. When we start to fail through that journey, through that wilderness, rather than riding each other up, encouraging each other to create these false gods, giving our jewelry and melting it down, remind each other that we are in the hands of a faithful God and that our journey with Him and with each other to Him is a journey that is protected by Him and no matter how arid and fearful no matter how scary and dark it seems He's always there and at the right time He will appear because in this fellowship, in this communion, with him as our head, we are safe, we are comforted, and we are reassured that he will never, ever leave or forsake us. And we will be together.